Hi guys, welcome back to Alamat, where we translate and narrate Philippine myths, urban legends, and horror stories to share to the world. I hope you guys are enjoying the story so far. And for this second episode, we have two long scary stories that happened in the Philippines. Let's start with the first story from Glenn777 on Reddit's No Sleep. A couple of years ago, my sister passed away without any apparent reason. I mean, she wasn't sick or had any illness that might have triggered her premature death. She might not be in full health, but I was sure that she wasn't anywhere near death. Years before the tragic event, I had dreams about her. In my dreams, she always seemed happy. Every dream I had with her had always started in a very nice place, with very nice weather. But they always ended into something that no one would want to experience. They went something like this. We were eating or talking with my family, laughing, and suddenly, everything went different. We were now running away from someone or something. My mind told my body that we have to run, run as fast and as far away as possible. My sister's face was so terrified that time, and somehow, I knew that something was after my sister. It wanted her so much, up to the point that I can feel its eagerness to get her. We ran again and again and again, but there was no way we could get away from it. We hid under the table of some public building I am familiar with, and we thought we had finally outran that something that was following us, but of course, we were wrong. We saw it standing in the far corner of that room, directly looking at us, but it didn't do anything but stare at us, and that made us so uneasy. The uneasiness that it gave us was becoming less bearable every second until we couldn't stand it any longer, and we thought we were goners. After that, I woke up suddenly. Strange feelings coursing through my body, thinking what had happened. And the moment that I had opened my eyes, the dream had started to slide in the back of my head. That specific experience kept coming back in my dreams. Not every night though, but enough for me to remember it forever. I should say that the dreams were not exactly like that, and they didn't always happen in the same place. But they were always something... <laughs> but they were always like someone or something was coming towards us and that we had to run. Years passed by and this tragic event finally happened. My sister died. Before we delivered her to her final place, some guy had decided to talk to us and what he said had brought chills to our spines and also confirmed my suspicions. This guy is very popular in his town because he sees things no one can see. He hears things no one can hear. And the people in that town who know him call him Malaki Mata, or in English, Big Eye. They said that whatever this Big Eye sees is more or less true because they said that his former neighbor had lost a father at New Year's Eve. But prior to that unfortunate event, Big Eye had come to his neighbor and said that, I'm really sorry, but I have to tell you this. Your new year will be full of sadness. Someone will die in your family. And of course, no one believed him until what he'd said came true. 
going back to my story. Big Eye came to us with a story. He said that fate is indeed very cruel. He couldn't believe that such a jolly woman would meet her death at such a young age. He told us that the morning before my sister died, she died at around 5 in the afternoon, he was walking to a bake shop near my sister's house to buy some pandesal, which is a type of bread that can be found here in the Philippines. While he was walking, he saw her in the porch of her house, entertaining a huge number of visitors, men, women, and children. And he thought that they were her family or maybe friends. He seemed so content and happy while she was looking at her guests. This guy had even thought that maybe somebody had a birthday to celebrate that day. That's why they were so early to come to her house just to prepare. And that's why she was so happy in welcoming them. We called in my sister's live-in partner and retold the story to him. He was actually so shocked because they never had visitors that day, especially at the crack of dawn. In fact, he remembers that they were still asleep at that time. Big Eye said that what he'd seen might have been her sundo. A sundo is a spirit or an entity that comes to you to pick you up from the living. It also confirmed that my dreams about her were a premonition that something was coming after her to get her. My mom also told us her story about her experience with the premonition about my sister's death. She said that the afternoon of the day my sister died. My sister called my mom and they had talked about the noontime show they both loved to watch and how funny the main host was. She also told her that she had eaten a lot for her lunch and that she was still full. They talked for about half an hour when suddenly... My mother couldn't hear a word from my sister anymore. She kept calling her name, but still got no response. And after some time, she responded, but not through words. She was moaning, as if something terrible was happening to her, and that she needed help. My sister's house was about 18 miles away from our place. I know it really isn't that far, but here in the Philippines, the distance is actually pretty far with the traffic and the commute. The estimated time to travel is around 2-3 to hours. And since my family and I are unfortunate, or poor if you may, we actually don't have a car and we couldn't just rush our way to help her. We felt really helpless. My mom is really weak when it comes to tragedies like these. And she almost collapsed when she heard the moaning. I had to deceive her to prevent her from fainting. I told her it was not moaning. It might be feedback from the television. She stopped panicking, but I know she didn't really buy what I said. She said when she went to the bathroom to pee, she heard that someone had whispered in her ear, Loud enough for her to hear it. The whisper was, Abby is dead. Of course, she didn't believe that. We didn't believe that either. How could she be dead when she was just talking to my mom a while ago? It's just ridiculous to believe in something like that. But alas, that was the truth. She was dead at exactly the time my mom heard that whisper. Even now, Those thoughts are flashing in my mind vividly, as if they just happened yesterday. Well, in fact, they happened more than two years ago. I don't know if sundo and premonitions are real or not, but with the continuous grief we are still experiencing, the one thing I am sure that's real is that my sister is now dead, and we will never see her again. Postscript I apologize if the construction of my story was not that good. English is not my first language, so I can't express my thoughts very well. (laughs) 
This story is a supposedly true story about something that is happening during the quarantine time in Manila. The story is called Something is Stalking the Streets of Manila During Quarantine. Last night, someone took their own life in our township. We discovered this when we woke up today to a commotion in the streets outside our home. Like most countries in the world, the Philippines is under lockdown. It's much stricter here in the capital, so we're all pretty much at home most of the time anyway. There were police vans and media vans everywhere, their cars clogging up the street and they themselves were congregated right outside Mrs. Bautista's gate, just a few houses removed from ours. A crowd had already gathered at the edge of the police cordon that was hastily put up, and their neighbors were at Twitter with subdued but nonetheless animated conversation. It was a funny sight, given that social distancing here was strictly enforced. At least, most of them are wearing masks, I thought. After taking time to put on my own mask and face shield, it was still required at the time, and assuring my dad and my wife that I'll get to the bottom of things. I made my way to the gathered crowd. I wasn't really relishing squeezing through them to find out what was what, but curiosity propelled me forward. I had just gotten to the head of the pack when they started rolling out a body bag through the gate and hastily loading it up at the back of a white truck of the kind normally used for deliveries here in our country. A hush fell over everyone as this was happening. Even I just stared at the whole spectacle in silence. When they slammed the door shut, it seemed to jolt everyone awake. The gathered crowd erupted into a roar of speculation. Terrified and nervous assertions but mostly just asking, what the hell happened? Mrs. Bautista was one of the longest staying residents of our little town deep within Manila. She was one of the nicest too, always willing to help anyone who asked her. She was close friends with my grandmother and visited often. When I was younger, she used to pinch my cheeks until they hurt. From our investigation, it appears she committed suicide, said the officer who walked over to us. What do you mean she killed herself? She's a good person. She seemed really happy, asked Auntie Rose. She lived across from us and was usually quiet. The fear was evident in her face, and when she was done with her question, her eyes met mine. You could see the panic building up. The answer to her question was not forthcoming. The officer, who served as spokesperson, shifted gears and started shouting for us to clear the way for the cadaver truck to pass through, followed by the other cop cars. He himself embarked and left, followed all the way by pleading people shouting their questions and demand for answers. We all lingered in the area for a bit casting nervous glances towards Mrs. Bautista's gate, which was now sealed shut by crime scene tape and crudely barricaded with saw horses emblazoned with Philippine National Police. Everyone started slowly moving back towards their homes when people realized that there were going to be no clear definite answers to their questions. I was about to leave myself as my wife was waving for me frantically from our open gate when Auntie Rose grabbed my arm. As I turned to face her, she shushed me and drew me closer to whisper. Binalatan siya, which meant she was skinned. What? That was the only thing I could muster in response. A chill running through my skin and the hair standing at the back of my neck. Last night, Mrs. Bautista's neighbor heard crying and pleading coming from that house, answered Auntie Rose, pointing to the barricaded gate with her pursed lips as is common in our country. I was really taken to a back to answer 
so instead followed her pointing with my eyes. Mrs. Bautista was begging someone not to hurt her. She was also praying. Did the police say anything about who did it? I said. Don't be noisy, she admonished before glancing around her as if to check if anyone was eavesdropping. The police said that her body was found without its skin, crumpled in the corner of her bedroom. They believed it was suicide just because the entire house was completely sealed shut. All the doors and windows were locked from the inside. She paused for a moment to pull out a cigarette from her pocket. I had known her to have kicked that habit for many years now, but didn't say a word. I had quit myself, but what Auntie Rose said next made me wish I hadn't. What's scary is that they didn't find her skin. I told my dad and wife everything I knew, and it sent them in quite the panic. My dad started urging us to pray more. We are a Catholic country, though my wife and I are atheists. And my wife hopped on a video call with her family in the province. The lockdown has been in effect for a month and a half already, and she hasn't been able to come home to visit since then. I'm sure the I'm sure the horror of this morning didn't help at all with her missing them. I could hear her being comforted by her dad in our bedroom, so my dad and I set about to inspect our house. We were scared as hell and wanted to be sure that we would be secure by the time night fell. Our house, to be entirely fair, is pretty secure. Built in the 70s, it featured grills on all the windows, as was common in the Philippines during that era. Our back door, which opened up into the garage and laundry area, was a huge and heavy metal affair that had to be locked with a key the size of a finger. We spent a good part of an hour going over the entire house. Maybe a part of us was half expecting to find some hidden monster or demon waiting to pounce. When we were done, it was about lunchtime and my wife stepped out of our room, looking much more comforted. I walked over and gave her a hug and told her it was going to be all right. She nodded silently, and we just found comfort in each other's arms until she patted me on the back and said she would prepare lunch. The rest of the day proceeded with some semblance of normalcy. I went to do my job as a writer for a comms company in the UK, and my wife settled back into studying for law school. My dad just went back to lie on his favorite couch, and spent the day playing his word games on his smartphone. Deep in the afternoon, one could almost imagine the horrors of the morning, a far off and distant thing. The fear only started to creep in again as the sky started to darken with the impending night. You could hear people on the streets rushing to get home. By the time night had fully set in, a loaded silence descended upon our town. My wife herself started to draw the curtains around the house. She normally argued with me to keep them open, hot as it is in our country at this time of the year. As she did that, I started locking the house down. I started with the heavy door out in the back and made my way through each room and ended with the front door, which I promptly triple bolted. It was at this point that my dog, normally quiet but highly active, started to whimper and whine. As I leaned in to pet her, she bolted from our bedroom, where she normally spent the night, and crawled under the bed like the devil was after her. This gave us pause to listen, but there really was nothing but silence as we settled for dinner. Mrs. Bautista, in their little town, made the national news that night. News outlets quickly tagged it as the most shocking crime of the decade. Experts were phoning in to give their two cents worth. One said it could be a crime of passion, another that it was an angry relative, yet one other claimed it was possibly a serial killer. That last one is funny, given how utterly rare it is to have a serial killer in the Philippines. By my recollection, Only one has ever been recorded in our history. What all these experts and even the chief of police in our city 
failed to answer is the question of how a killer got in with the home thoroughly locked down. If that wasn't creepy enough, the reports also stated that the crime scene was relatively bloodless, and we could see that for ourselves since Ms. Bautista's room was shown. Beyond her body, which was thankfully blurred out heavily to allow us to keep our dinners, the room was spotless. We could tell that what happened to her was horrific. Even through the blur, you could only make out reds and blacks exclusively. While you couldn't see the full thing, it got to my wife, who promptly ran to the bathroom and vomited out all of her dinner. We stopped eating after that. We went to bed relatively early, given the horror of the situation we were in. And I only woke up hours later because our dog, Washi, was running about our bedroom while barking furiously. When my wife woke up shortly after me, she sat up and opened the lamp beside our bed. We both stared at Washi for a bit, not having shaken off the stupor of sleep. It took a while for reality to set in, and my wife was the first to register clear panic. You see, we're kind of used to our dog doing this ever since we let her sleep with us a few months ago, and there would be nights where she'd excitedly run around the room, sniffing and barking at windows, the walls, the floor, the door, in frantic succession. We always just brushed it off as mice she smells or hears in our walls and about the house as it was really old. The night, of course, was different. We shushed her, a futile effort, and sat silently trying to hear for whatever was bothering her. There was nothing, apart from Washi going apeshit. The night seemed quiet. I got up, as I usually did when this happened, with the intention of letting Washi out of the room. It was a cycle, really. We'd let her out. She'd do the same thing around the house, barking and sniffing, before begging to be let into our bedroom and quietly settling down for sleep. This night was different in light of this morning's events. For one, she eventually settled to barking and growling at our bedroom door. This was something she never did before. Almost instinctively, I grabbed the aluminum bat I kept in the room for protection, and quietly made my way to the door. As I grabbed the knob, I looked back at my wife, who seemed to be barely keeping herself together. And with a deep breath, I gripped the knob and the bat in my hands tighter, and pulled the door open, bat drawn high up, and body tense to strike. There was nothing there but our darkened living room. Even my dog fell silent then. Well, not so silent. She was whimpering in fear, her body as flat to the floor as she could manage, and her tail firmly tucked beneath her trembling form. Furtively, I stepped outside, inching my way on, near tiptoes towards the living room light switch. With every step I took, my dog withdrew slowly, until she was close to our bed near the windows. By the time I flipped on the light switch, she hopped on the bed and cuddled close and tight with my wife. There was nothing there. I did the cursory walkthrough of my home with my bat still in my hands, checking every door, window, and shadowed corner of our house. It was when I reached the front door to check on the dead bolts that I finally heard it. It sounded like the skittering of rats, but I instinctively knew it wasn't rats. The sound was much louder in volume, but quiet in intensity, if that makes sense. My dog heard it too. I imagined in greater detail as she buried her head in my wife's arms. My wife couldn't seem to hear it. Our air conditioning unit droned pretty loud, so she wordlessly mouthed. What is it? I shrugged my shoulders and started to turn my head about, trying to find the source of the sound. 
though it would flare up every few moments. Where it was coming from eluded me for quite some time, until I realized that it was coming from the street outside. I made my way slowly to the receiving room that separated our area of the home from the front door. The door to access that room had a bell attached, the kind to tell you that someone had come in. My grandmother and her caregiver lived in another part of our home. Because of this, I had to open that door very slowly. All the while, the skittering would come and go in bursts. By the time I had made it to the front door, it was silent once more. It stayed quiet for a while. I had already confirmed that the front door was firmly shut and bolted, but I felt drawn to the large bay window beside it and peeked outside. Our front gate was wide open. This isn't a new thing. My cousin, whose family lived in the area of the house below us, occasionally forgot to close the gate when she left for her graveyard shift job at the local call center. I was about to storm out, irritated, to close and secure it when I finally saw it. It entered my field of view in the split second that I was slowly pulling my gaze from the window. It looked like a terribly tall, desiccated corpse standing on all fours. Framed by our open gate, I got a full view of the thing from the side. Its skin was sickly brown and clung to its very thin, long, and slender bones. It was almost leathery and in some sections somewhat transparent. The effect was most horrific on its head, which looked like a human skull. There were cups of thin white hair all about its crown, and where its eyes and nose should have been were just empty recesses. As it waved its head about, seemingly sniffing the air, if that were even possible, its mouth clicked open and shut. It had rows of teeth sharpened to points and seemed to gasp desperately for air each time its mouth drew open. Really, it looked for all the world to be a skinny, horrible corpse, but for the long, sharp claws where its hands and fingers should have been. I was stunned and couldn't move. Thankful that I hadn't thought to turn the lights in the room I was in. I stared at it for what seemed like hours until I heard a click-click in the distance that snapped me awake. I noticed it too and bounded out of sight, tap 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 skittering off to the distance until the night fell still once again. My wife eventually made her way to me and hugged me, frantically asking me if I was alright. It was then that I noticed that I was drenched in cold sweat and out of myself for a time. Eventually, I drew her into a hug and told her I was okay. Sure, I was far from okay. I was terrified, but I did not want her to panic more than she already was. She kept asking me what happened. Each time, I told her nothing was the matter. I repeated this so many times, I almost believed it. We eventually made our way back to our bedroom where Washi was. My dog greeted me with her usual excitement, jumping all about me, trying to lick my face. She was so excited, she eventually slipped and fell on her back. This made my wife and I laugh hysterically, and seemed to break the gloom that had unknowingly descended on our home. My wife is asleep beside me now, with her dog curled at her feet. They look so peaceful and normal. Everything kind of feels normal until I close my eyes and see it again. Jesus, what was that thing? Actually, the more important question for me is, how the fuck do I protect my family? If you guys enjoyed the stories, don't forget to like and subscribe. It would help me out a lot. If you have any suggestions and recommendations, write them down 
in the comment section below. All the sources from the stories can be found in the description box. Once again, thank you guys and see you in the next one.